In 1963, a young minister brought together a congregation of like-minded believers to establish a new church in Bothell, Washington. From the outset, they agreed to measure their success by a simple yet profound goal, to answer God's call to be a center of hope, refuge, and service in their community. That minister was Floyd Cronkite, a native of New England with an Ivy League education and an unusual path to ministry. He fell in love with the Northwest and with a Northwest girl. Through a series of God-ordained circumstances, together they set out to start a church in the then small town of Bothell on the northern edge of King County in the Seattle metro area. I'm Sherry Cronkite. My husband was the organizing minister of this church back in 1963 was our first service. Uh, at that time I became the pianist <laughs> and the organist, uh, which had not been in my plan, but ended up doing it for the 30 years we were here. Given his credentials and the available opportunities at established churches, it was out of the ordinary that they would plant a church in that location at that time. Quite a hard uh, way to go, <laughs> really. Um, but he kind of had ideas, dreams of kind of how he would like a church to be. Part of his education was in psychology, part of it, of course, in theology, and he liked to put the two together. And uh, it was kind of a new idea. Um, and they were kind of feeling around with the way to have a church. Uh, do we want to just meet in homes? I, you know, like maybe the very first early churches did. Uh, just kind of which direction did we want to go? And in those days, starting a new church meant introducing yourself the old-fashioned way. The minister, Reverend Cronkite, went door to door and was talking to people, inviting them to come to this opening session. And, and it was right next door to our house on West Hill. Floyd Cronkite was a minister, a person, who talked to me like an ordinary person, uh, far from ministers I, or the minister I grew up with. And that impressed me. And I said, hey, I can talk to this guy. And in the services too, when we got going to church, I felt that he talked to me personally, like he was talking to me like, like I was the only one there. <laughs> and I appreciated that so much. I'm Larry Gibbons and started attending the uh, Emanuel Presbyterian Church in 1969. And I'm Mary Ann Gibbons. We came to the church as young parents. The church became a rock to me. I had some health problems at the time and the church has meant everything to me through my life. After our second child was born, I experienced the postpartum depression and it wasn't just the short term, it was in for a long term. So. After struggling for a year with the postpartum depression, I came to the church one Sunday and Floyd's message changed my life, um, gave me hope again and I developed a deep friendship with him um, and he helped me through the next few years. Um, finding myself again and being the person that God had planned for me to be. The pattern of care and service that Floyd Cronkite had established continued to flourish under the direction of Steve Knowles, pastor at Emmanuel from 1996 to 2011. When Annette and Earl Sandy lost their youngest son to cancer, Pastor Knowles provided a practical way for Earl to process his grief, honor his son, and weave his story into that of the congregation. When Glenn died, I asked the minister uh, what I could do to help in the memory of Glenn at our church. And he, right away, he said, build me a baptismal font. And I said, I can do that. So uh, it's this one right here, and it, uh, it, it uh, I see it every Sunday I come here, and it reminds me, of course, Glenn. And what was modeled by the leader was evident in the congregation as well. 
I'm Warren Weber. Well, I've been in this church for 17 years. Uh, the second time we came to this church, Pam Johnson was a member of this church who well, passed away shortly ago. But well, uh, she said we had a son who was well, a year, year and a half old at that time. And she said, he needs to come over and spend an evening with me so that you guys can go out for dinner. And we were like, I think God is speaking to us <laughs> right here. So that was, yeah, after that we were, we're staying here. And now, after half a century as a congregation, the people of Emmanuel still aspire to the same simple idea of what it means to be a successful church. I think the thing that was profound that drew me to Emmanuel was that this was a church that seemed to be comfortable in its body. Uh, the thing that I was praying for as I made the transition from after 17 and a half years at UPC to another congregation, the thing that I was praying for was that I would um, be a part of a church that wasn't worried about what it wasn't. It seems like a lot of churches are anxious, and anxious specifically about why they're not like they used to be or how they should be more of what they need to become. And I didn't sense any of that anxiety on the, the part of Emmanuel. Uh, they were a church that seemed to have a strong sense of their own identity and had just rebuilt their building. Uh, I think that was a profound uh, uh, symbol uh, for me of something that was going on here because 32, 35 families, something like that, decided to take on a million dollar project to rebuild their building because they their building was falling apart. And um, that's pretty unusual. That decision to rebuild has proven to be just as significant as the decision to establish the church. As the project manager for the reconstruction, Warren Weber had a unique vantage point among church members. Yeah, building the church was a well, fascinating process. Well, when it first began, I, I was a big naysayer. I said, there's no way in the world that a congregation this size could do a project this size. And Steve Myers, who was the head of the capital campaign, and I were sitting down one day, and we said, if we followed the teachings of Jesus and sold everything and gave it to the church, we could pay for the church ourselves. And it was then that I realized that building the addition on a church was not a matter of ability, it was a matter of desire. You know, did the church, the congregation of the church, really desire to build the church? Because there was no question as to whether we had the ability to do it. And now with the benefit of hindsight and looking back going, yeah, there, there was some, the hand of God was there. <laughs> But the measure of success for this church is not ultimately about the size of its buildings, its number of members, or the impact of its programs. I have had the chance to read uh, some of Floyd's early sermons, and I really believe that what I see in them is something that is uh, congruent with, uh, with what I feel like God is calling me to give witness to uh, in this place, and it, it's the notion of faithful presence. As long as the community here believes that it's worthwhile for us to continue in existence, then we will. My vision doesn't sustain this place. Uh, my plans for growth don't sustain this place. They, they sustain it because they believe that it's worthwhile to be together in, in Christ's name, um, growing and learning and reaching out to others. And so the legacy continues. Fifty years ago, Floyd Cronkite offered very similar words to the congregation. Will we become a successful church? I hope that if we find success, that it will not be worldly success. I pray that we might find success similar to that achieved by the most successful church of all times. May it be said of us fifty years hence, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place.